Neil Brown just has that it factor, I believe. He's like, bought been, into the program. Everybody in the Big 12 is going to know his name, and all the quarterbacks are going to feel his pain. That underdog so, mentality has always been big for West Virginia. We're just heartbroken that we were not good at our jobs. He is the modern-day Don Nealon. Trust the climb. And now it's time for the Country Roads Webcast. What's going on, Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into another edition of the Country Roads Webcast. And it is that time. It is time for some Mountaineer football. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Cruz, joined by my co-host, Steven. What up, everybody? And our other co-host, Bradley. What's up? All right, boys, so I figured uh, before we uh, jump in and dive in, talk a little bit about uh, the matchup and the uh, Maryland game, uh, we could talk a little bit about the uh, new news. Uh, that's a tongue twister. The new news in terms of realignment, I guess if you could call it that, is uh, the alliance that has been formed between the Big Ten, Pac-12, and ACC just announced this past week. Um, pretty much, basically, uh, from what I gather, just a scheduling alliance. Uh, but any any thoughts on that, uh, Stephen? Uh, you want to add? Uh, it's it's a little intriguing just because um, the Big Twelve was left out. But um, as far as you know, all of the things in terms of scheduling and and things of that nature, um, it doesn't sound anything too crazy in my mind because i mean really what it is is it's them forming an alliance essentially to combat the sec and their 16 teams they're saying hey we have 40 what is it 41 42 teams against your 16 and saying that you know the sec you're not going to take over the college football the way that you think you're that you're going to and more than anything else i think that's more more of what that says to me Yeah, it's just they were, they were just trying to combat the SEC. I think, you know, it's more of anything, of, like you said, of them saying, hey, you know, we're not going to be left out of this. If you guys are going to make moves, we're going to try and make, make some moves too. But, however, I don't really know what this amounts to other than trying to, you know, throw something at the SEC and hope something sticks because you're talking about, what, maybe one or two non-conference games a year. And who knows if by the time that – this is supposed to happen 2024, 2025, if, if it even will, because who knows if these teams will be even in this conference. So to me, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not the, not the best thing. And they called it historic, but I don't really think you can call it historic because I don't know. Uh, but I was listening. There's not even any contracts involved. These, these three mm-hmm. conferences haven't signed any contracts. They literally said it was based on a handshake and looking each other in the eyes. So I'm like, I, I think this is a bunch of nothing really. Uh, Bradley, what about you? Yeah, I don't think it's that much. Like you said, I think a lot of it comes down to there's no contracts, nothing signed yet. There's been no hand shook. They looked each other in their eye and said, hey, the SEC is trying to dick us all over, and we need to kind of like band together. And then you turn around and have USC scheduling a game like it's you know, LSU or whatever it was. Right. And so it's just like, you know, I, I get that the, everybody's like, these other conferences are worried about the <laughs> SEC and how crazy it is the SEC has that kind of power just from, you know, their 16 teams. But, I mean – it is what it is, but I think that these other conferences, at least like looking at each other and being like, "Hey, like we're gonna have to like work together and let them know that they're not gonna be able to turn you know college football into NFL Junior, that you know we're in this as well. It's not just gonna be SEC, ESPN country." And so I think that this is just gonna be, yeah, I think it's a little bit of a nothing burger right now, but I think it is kind of a clue or a sign of what we can look to. I think they're gonna try to wait it out to like twenty six, twenty, yeah, twenty twenty six. And because I think that's when some of these other television programs can kind of like jump in and go a little bit more interested and kind of like fight back against ESPN and the Disney conglomeration that's, you know, all reaching, you know. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm right there with you. I think that that's what made it the most comical to me was, of course, like I said, when I found out there's no signed contracts, it's literally just a handshake agreement, which. In 2021, what's that worth? Maybe, you know, in 1950, that may have been worth something. But now I I don't really see it as much, especially as underhanded as some of these conferences and teams and stuff have proven to be. But like you said, USC comes out, what, days after that's announced and says they're going to have a non-conference game with LSU, which is supposed to be the conference that 
this alliance is forming to fight against. So I, I don't know. I think, I think it's, it's comical at best to me, but uh, Steven, anything else you want to add on that? Uh, yeah. I just, I just think that it more so is a pub, not a publicity stunt, but you, you know what I'm saying when I'm, you know, it's something along the lines of that. It's, like I said, it's basically telling the SEC publicly that you're not going to take over, you know, the collegiate college football, you know, predominantly, but all of college sports is what it seems like that the SEC is trying to take over to me. Um, it's about and, the best they could do right now is just being like, instead of like having signed contracts when like it's hard to do when you have like TV deals and everything else going on, it's their way of just telling the SEC like, hey, we're willing to work together, <laughs> you know? Right, like we're, like, we're willing to sit down and talk about it. Like we, you may have ESPN, but we have each other, and we, you know, it's us. We have a lot more than you, so I, you yeah, know, it sounds ABC bad saying Fox it like and, that, but I, but I really do believe it. It's more, it's more of a, um, you know, telling the SEC that they're not going to take over as much as they're as they're planning on doing. Right, it, it's 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 more just a alliance, alliance uh, against the SEC more than anything, you know. When it comes to that way that you know that these conferences will have your back when it comes to voting on college playoff expansion or voting on you know what have you uh, moving forward that whatever may happen. But it also to me speaks to the fact that I think Stephen, you mentioned it briefly, um, kind of maybe the death of the Big Twelve. Um, I know that a lot of us have kind of felt that already, but if nothing else, it's really made the Big 12 right now be proactive, and you've heard a lot of expansion rumors now coming out full force. Not that you haven't before, but now um, supposedly, I believe it was The Athletic that first reported it, uh, serious talks of the Big 12 adding BYU. So let's say the Big 12 adds BYU and adds you know two to three other teams. Uh, do you think that – persuades West Virginia to stick around, particularly if those two or three other teams are on the East with West Virginia, or do you think this is just another reason West Virginia should be looking uh, to find, you know, another home, Bradley? Um, I think that it is going to at least like buffer some of that urgency WVU fills the need to leave. I think that they're going to be a little bit happier. The fact that we are like, at least the big 12 is bringing some people in, it's going to make it an easier chance for like WVU to just like keep up with a consistent schedule. You're going to have a more well put together, together conference. And so I think that's going to make it easier for West Virginia to kind of pull out their game plan, which is what we talked about earlier in the year where I said, I think West Virginia is really trying to wait out a couple of years, get this big buyout from Texas and Oklahoma, and then maybe jump ship in a couple of years it might make it a little bit more difficult in the sense that we're also going to have to buy our way out now, let's say with BYU and stuff like that, but we'd also have a better chance of negotiating that than what Texas and Oklahoma are doing. So I think it does kind of like soften that blow, like allow us to, you know, get in a good conference schedule for the next couple of years and build our resume a little bit more. But I still think that WVU is trying to hop out and go to the ACC as soon as possible. Steven? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I think West Virginia is, you know, looking to get out. I don't, I don't know when that'll be. It's kind of interesting to me because, you know, you feel like West Virginia, and and not only West Virginia, but a lot of the other eight teams should have, you know, a couple weeks ago, whenever Texas and Oklahoma announced that they were jumping ship, you know, you felt like a lot of teams would have announced then that they were going to leave, and then the Big Twelve would have folded right there. Would have, it would have been the end of it, and then everything would have. You know, we wouldn't have been talking about all this. So it's kind of interesting to me that, you know, the eight teams are still together and the Big 12 is already talking about adding BYU. And, and, you know, you might have a couple other, you know, guys come in and make it a Big 12 once again instead of a, being a Big 10 or a Big 8, is, you know, whatever it's been in the past decade or so that West Virginia has been in the conference. Um, so they're trying to, you know, they're going to go after BYU. Probably UCF is probably going to be a big get that they're going to try to try to get. But the thing for me is it's not going to be, um, financial-wise, it's not going to be enough to sustain that conference and keep it at the level that it's been at, you know, for how many, how long now, how many years. Uh, you don't have the money that Texas right. or OU brings, and, and as much as I hate to admit it, for West Virginia, you, you, you don't want to fall into a conference. You have to be carried by someone like that. I don't want to say carried because West Virginia is, you know, a big boy in their own right, but they're, you know, we're fooling ourselves if we're talking, you know, and saying that we have the same type of financial stability that Texas or OU has or, you know, or a place like that. 
So if you're West Virginia and you want to compete, you know, for a national championship uh, along the line somewhere, you have to be in a conference with someone that is going to be able to financially, you know, provide for that conference, if you if you will. Right. And that's and that's what sticks out to me. I think I've mentioned uh, this to both of you guys um, off air, but um, the Big 12, you know, they go out at BYU. To me, that's another West th- West Coast team that's, you know, not helping West Virginia any. Um, another another sign that I hope that we find the door. But to me, even if you add, let's say you add BYU, let's say you add Cincinnati, UCF, Houston, South Florida, whoever. Um, basketball side you kind of have a face still because you have a presence with kansas but football wise who's your who's your money maker who's the face of your conference that's that's carrying your team you know before you had texas and oklahoma that's you know carrying the conference you don't really have that now you know i I love west virginia as much as the next guy but we're not the team that's going to be the one that and nationally they're like that's the presence right there you know you don't have that who who i mean iowa state's hot right now but even you know historically that's not a big name i mean they they're up there right now in the rankings top 10 and stuff but football wise i think the big 12 is in trouble because you don't you don't have someone to carry that conference like, like Stephen was saying yeah and i think it's something also like to think about is like with this uh football playoff expansion you know you got the five best conference championships you know i'm guessing that would still include the big 12 but then, like, if you don't get that conference championship, then what's your resume builder? I mean, is a win over a Baylor, and uh, I mean, you got Iowa State that's been up there. Like, we uh, they've trying to keep their program if they can keep that consistency. Iowa State has really a chance of making themselves, you know, a really good program. And I think West Virginia is no knockoff, but we can't beat ourselves. So, like, other than Iowa State, what are our big wins? I mean, we can't really go to the conference playoff committee and be like, oh, we beat BYU when you got. Uh, maybe a team like Auburn that has a couple wins over something like you, like an like an LSU or like a an Oklahoma or Texas in that conference. So it's like, what are, what are our resume builders? We just don't have that anymore because now the resume is basically, in my opinion, us and Iowa State, and we're not even you know that much of a quality win right now as compared to Iowa State, which I think we will get there, especially under Neil Brown. But I just don't think that like if you're wanting to compete for a championship, I just don't think playing. UCF and Memphis and stuff like that is just going to get us there as quickly as what it would have done with something like, like you said, you don't have that big, big win or defining, not even just money, but like talk about like progression of your, uh, yourself, you know? Yeah. One thing, one thing that's really interesting that I've heard though, is, you know, with this whole addition of BYU to the conference is that there some, or a lot of people have talked about moving the big 12 championship game out of Arlington and bringing it to Morgantown. And so that would that would be really interesting. But even still, as you know, even being a Mountaineer fan, I don't think that I would I would be a fan of that move. That that'd be something to make West Virginia stay. Yeah, you go from playing in a dome to playing the Big Twelve Championship game in the snow most years. <laughs> yeah, that does make things really interesting. Yeah, those Texas schools having to play in the snow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just I don't I wouldn't see that happening. <laughs> I I don't I. Don't, I was about to say I'd, I'd love it, but I don't. I don't see the other uh, conference members agreeing on that one. No, I don't. I don't see them agreeing to that either. Um, all right, so a uh, little bit of realignment talk to uh, start it off. Uh, hadn't done that in a couple episodes, so figured it was uh, well overdue with the announcement of the alliance and the BYU rumors. But uh, anything you guys want to add on that front before we uh, jump in and talk uh, this Maryland matchup and the game one preview of twenty twenty one. Nope, I think I'm. I think I'm all talked out on alliance. Until we have more, you know, concrete information on the subject, I think that, you know, it's it's all it's all hearsay and rumors at this point. So, yeah, at this point in time, I think it's just it's time for football season. Though. Let's play some football. Let's put the conference talks and alliance talks all to the side, and let's uh, let's get the throw in the pigskin run, you know. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. Let's let's do it. Let's talk some Mountaineer football, specifically uh, game one coming up now. Uh, we're recording this actually, uh, which will be a week away from game day recording on Saturday. A uh, little weekend recording this time, but, uh, you know, it's it's about time. Mountaineer football's here. I guess it's officially, officially game week, you know, with us recording at this time. But uh, taking on Maryland on the road, a road opener, um, 
opening thoughts uh, about the matchup, you know, whatever. However you want to lead into this, I'll let you guys jump it off. Uh, Steven, what do you got? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this game. Um, week one games are always really interesting to me because you don't have anything to go on um, other than what, you know, the team's roster was in the previous year. Um, and so you haven't really seen any any teams do anything. But this game in particular is really interesting because you have two teams that you don't really know a whole lot about, but at the same time are supposed to be pretty good and pretty improved football teams. Um, you know, with Talia, you know, he he played a pretty good season last year despite some of his numbers. And, you know, I'm really excited to see how our defensive line gets pressure on him and stops the run. Um, and and I'm also excited to see how how our secondary fares, you know, with – with how everything played out last year with losing Jamal Adai and Tyke and everything. I want to see how those guys bounce back and look in game one against a, you know, a pretty solid football team. Absolutely. I think uh, starting off with a rivalry game, that's, you know, big and you don't get to see that a lot. And of course a road opener, a true road opener, you don't get to see that a lot. So it's going to be a great test for a team that's, you know, been trusting the climb. And this is uh believed to be and should be uh, the best team so far of the Neil Brown era. And so uh, interesting to see how they're going to start off with this challenge on the road. Uh, Bradley, what about you? Any opening thoughts? Um, Just for people that don't know, Maryland went two and three last year. They only got five games. So we did get twice as much experience as they did last year. You know, twice as many starts for our starters and returners and stuff like that coming back. Um, They won some games they shouldn't have. They lost some games they shouldn't have. So, uh, Maryland's pretty, like Steve said, they're pretty big question mark, pretty big unknown. They're under their third year of a head coach, just like we are. Um, and like everybody says, the third year under a head coach is really the defining year. You know, you could really, uh, a good litmus test of um, how programs are doing. I've watched a bunch of preseason predictions and previews uh, from Maryland side, and just about everyone I've watched has had us losing. I think we're a three-point favorite right now. But just about every one of them I've seen has had us losing. And I, I think that's because people believe Maryland has this uh, tendency to come out guns blazing and fall off towards the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think that's kind of like driving them, and everybody believes that Talia is just, you know, uh, a really quality quarterback and that he's got really good weapons around him. So, I mean, it's a, it's a team you got to keep your eye on. No slouch. Absolutely, and I think that the that to me is the, my biggest concern of the game. As you mentioned, the weapons around him. I know he's got a few solid receivers: uh, Deshaun Jones, uh, Raheem Jarrett, and then the other one whose name uh, slips my mind right now. But and then you know Talia. I think a lot of people look last year he had seven interceptions, but to me that shows uh, one thing, and that's that he has no fear. He's going to be a gunslinger. He's going to come out there, and yeah, he may have thrown seven interceptions last year, but he also had a couple. What I think he had one, what three, four touchdown games. So he's uh, he's a guy that I think has potential, of course. And looking at his brother, you can see that it's in his blood. And as far as West Virginia, uh, Stephen mentioned you know losing Jamal Adai, got a new defensive backs coach in, and Shadon Brown. And then you also lose Dershawn Miller and Tyke Smith. So I think it's going to be a big test for Scotty Young, for Jackie Matthews, for Daryl Porter Jr., lockdown corner, for um, Charles Woods, the other transfer. We got all those new guys that are filling in the secondary. You know, you've got the experienced guys. You've got the Sean Mahomes. You've got the Alonzo Adais, the Kerry Martins, um, and the Nick Troy Fortune. You know, those guys will be solid. But I think it's going to be a big test for West Virginia's secondary, especially the new faces that are in that secondary and the new man leading that secondary in Shadon Brown because Maryland's strength of their offense is clearly going to be that pass game. So right away you're going to be tested and kind of see what you got there. Wouldn't you guys agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. That's what I that's what I'm really excited about because usually in week one, you know, you get a home game against a Georgia Southern or an EKU or you know what I mean, something to soften the blow a little bit up so you can get ready for your week two matchup who's, you know, sometimes probably a tougher opponent but this year it's it's reversed and so that's you know really interesting in my mind and you know I was going through the numbers the other day and I thought I found one thing that was really interesting um back in 1973 West Virginia played on the road for their for their uh for their opening game against Maryland in College Park and then in week two they came back to Morgantown and you know who they played that game 
Virginia Tech. They won both mm-hmm. games that season. And then I, was, I started looking at it that- even further. And, you know, I was like, I really hope that West Virginia ends up, you know, doing that again this year. But then they ended up going uh, six and five that season. So hopefully it's not too similar. <laughs> but, um, you know, West Virginia has only has only opened on the road, I think, eight times since 1970. So it, it's not a very popular occurrence. So I'm kind of excited to see how it ends up for West Virginia, you know, going into week two, and week three against some other non-conference opponents. Yeah, it's a it's a great great start for the season. To, you know, like you said, not only a road game, but you know the rivalry with Maryland because Maryland has traditionally been that kind of barometer game of your season. You know, especially in the past, you know, 10, 15 years or so, it's like when you beat Maryland, it's usually a pretty good season. And if you lose to Maryland, it's not a very good season because I think West Virginia has won what was it nine out of the last ten, and the one time that we lost um, was twenty thirteen, and we went four and eight that season. So I think. <laughs> The fact of Maryland being a barometer game uh, still holds true. And I think, Bradley, I think you mentioned as much on a previous podcast that Maryland will be kind of a, a good litmus test, a barometer of where this season will go go from here. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that is going to come down to, I mean, if you're Mountaineer fans and you're wanting to know how well the season's going to be, like you guys have brought up, your eyes have got to be on our defensive backs. Because, I mean, that is undoubtedly one of our most untested groups right now. That right there with uh, some of our linebacker position. And so, I mean, if you want to know how well WB is going to do this year and if we're going to live up to some ex- expectations or kind of like settle down, uh, you need to look at the that battle because it's that's where it's going to be at right there. Because, I mean, you've got a quality quarterback, quality wide receivers. They're, that's It's going to be a test. And it's first game of the year on the road, so it's not going to get much tougher than that. Absolutely. I think so. Uh, West Virginia's secondary is going to be tested, but I think that we could all agree the strength of West Virginia's defense is the defensive line. So, you know, Maryland's strength may be their pass, but um, West Virginia's pass rush could combat that. What do you think, Stephen? Uh, I think I think our pass rush will play a key part in the game, but I think what will we'll be, you know, one of the main difference makers is how well we stop the run. West Virginia didn't allow a rushing touchdown all of last year, and I'm hoping that that carries into this game as well. Because you know their running, their running game is pretty solid. That's what they held their, you know, all of their. That was what they ran all of their offense through last year. It seemed pretty much, other than when you know Tua got Talia got hot, rather. And so, um, if West Virginia's D line can you know stop the run and then in turn pressure Tua whenever they turn to the pass, then I think that'd be a really good day for West Virginia. I think it's going to be a pretty close game though. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be close. Um, West Virginia's defense is going to have to show up. Um, you know, the defense last year was you know number one pass defense in the nation, and they need they need that type of defense to show up, show up again. Uh, but flipping it around and looking at the West Virginia offense versus the Maryland defense, uh, what stands out to you there, Bradley? Um, with our offense versus their defense, I'm looking at the man himself, Letty Brown. I think that's going to be our the big key to this game, Maryland last year was one of the worst teams in the country on rushing defense, and they're not returning as many starters. And even if they are, like I said, they only got five games in last year. And I think that they might be improved in that area, but I think that we are just way more experienced in our run game than their defense is defending that run game. And I could see Letty Brown just really having a field day. And I think you'll see um, really conservative play calling from Neil Brown. I think you're going to see him keep it very between the tackles and then – uh, some simple pass schemes. I really don't think Neil Brown's ready to really dive into his bag yet. I think he's wanting to show his players like, hey, this is the game plan we've worked on throughout the summer. I want you to see what it looks like when we put that kind of scheme together. So I, I see Letty Brown getting a bunch of touches. I see him slamming it up the middle behind our uh, uh, behind our offensive line. And I think that Letty Brown's going to have over 100-yard day guaranteed with a couple touchdowns. I love it. I love the sound of that. I think I think I tend to agree with you. I think, you know, we're going to try and rely on the run game. I think last year, if you look, the formula in the games, not only that we won, but the games that we were very close to winning, um, we kind of grinded it out. We relied on our defense. We didn't really, you know, force the issue too much on offense, just tried not to make mistakes, you know, and 
be kind of slow and methodical. And I could kind of see us trying to make it that type of game because I think uh, Maryland, as I said, you know, their pass offense is their strength. And I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, trying to speed things up. And, you know, we can negate that with not only good defensive play, but also our offense uh, slowing things down, feeding Letty, you know, chewing clock, getting first down. So I'm not expecting a very high scoring affair. I am expecting a close game, like, like Steven said, but I think our offense has the pieces in place that even if the game plan is kind of vanilla for now, that we have enough guys that if we get in the ball in space, they can make plays. Uh, boatload of receivers that I think are really going to show up this year. And I think Letty Brown will have his first big game of the season. I agree with you, Bradley, in uh, in this one against Maryland. I've got him going over 100 also. Uh, Stephen, what are you thinking about the matchup between our offense and that Maryland defense? Uh, I, I'm like you guys. I think we're going to run it through Letty Brown. Of course, I mean, I've been high on Letty Brown all preseason, so that's no surprise. Uh, but this this defense is, is mainly led – um, by the secondary, and more specifically, their two safeties and Jordan Mosley and Nick Cross. Um, both of those guys have started nearly every game in their career, so you know they have a veteran group on that side or in on that area of their defense. Um, so I I think West Virginia is going to go to what they know best and try to run the ball and and try to run it down their throat all day. I, I'm like you, I don't think it's going to be a very high scoring affair. Um, I don't see it being a low scoring affair though. I think it's going to be somewhere right in the middle, uh, but. I see Letty having a pretty good game in week one, though. I really do. Something I could see Maryland definitely doing, though, is with those super experienced safeties and quarterbacks, I could definitely see them sending them up to help stop the run games. And they know that's what we're going to do. We're going to come in there. So, like, don't be surprised if you see us, like, take a couple big shots down the field after, you know, a Letty. you see Letty Brown break out a 20, 30-yard run. Don't be surprised if we turn around and try to drop a 30-yard bomb behind their safeties afterwards you know that and we also might be throwing out a little bit more swing passes they like to get letty brown mm. involved in the past so don't be surprised if he also catches you know a good six seven balls this game out in those swing passes or even just trying to like dump him in behind the linebackers and stuff because you know that those defensive backs are going to be keeping their eyes on him because especially with people having uh our wide receivers having a little bit of a down year last year they're probably might overlook that group and i think that we all know that that's a dangerous thing to do with the group that we've got they might be uh, a little bit unsure from last year, but I think we all know they're going to be improved. And so I think, I think they're all going to have their fun streaking down the field behind them. I don't see as much with the uh, intermediate passing game to move the sticks. I think that's going to come down to Letty Brown. But like I said, don't be surprised if you see Letty Brown get 15 yards just to turn around with Jared Daigie doing a play action pass and throw one 30, 40 yards down the field. No, I think so too. I mean, you know, Maryland knows that that's probably going to be what we try and do is uh, feed Lady Brown, uh, whether it be through the pass or through handoffs. And they definitely could load the box. And I think that's when you got to see hopefully the improved deep ball that they've been talking about all offseason uh, shows its head if Maryland does decide to do that. And you can hit a play action over the top to BF Dub or Sam James, Winston Wright, any one of those guys. So I, I would hope, hope to see that. And I think that it's a formula for success uh, pound the rock, play action over the top. That being said, um, I guess we can go ahead and jump over. You know, we were talking about some keys, but let's talk the key to victory in this game. Uh, what do you guys have? What needs to happen? The key to victory for West Virginia to start this season 1-0 and come out with a win on the road against Maryland. What do you got, Stephen? Uh, my key to victory is, uh, I mentioned it before on this episode, but how well WVU's D-line uh, gets pressure on Tua and, and is able to stop the run. I think if they're able to do that and they can, you know, really slow the game down for themselves. Um, I think it's going to be a very difficult task because I think, you know, if you look at the numbers on the past three seasons under Michael Loxley, as head coach up there, uh, the Maryland Terrapins have started off very hot uh, in the in the beginning of the season, and that's against tougher opponents. Uh, but, you know, you also look at it, I think West Virginia fans are, are planning on, you know, coming in large numbers up to College Park uh, next Saturday. So I don't, I don't necessarily see in West Virginia coming out of there with a loss, though. So uh, I don't know. It's it's really tough for me, man. I, I'm I'm really I'm really wanting to not be so scared of this game, but it really is. It's tough for me to to think about it right now in a, in a positive mindset when you look at at, at at all the talent on their roster. Yeah, I think it makes you nervous when you have a, a tough first game because you don't really. 
I mean, you can read reports. You can kind of know what to expect from your team. But to you see them out there on the field, you don't really know what exactly it's going to look like and what they have. And I think it's, it's like we said, starting with a road game, starting with a rivalry game, starting with another Power 5 team. It's definitely going to make you nervous. But I agree that's a, that's a great key for me. I'm going the West Virginia defense side for a key to victory as well. But rather than the defensive line, I'm going with, as I mentioned earlier, the secondary, specifically looking at the new faces in the secondary, I think will be the key to, to victory for West Virginia. You know, how those guys perform, how the Scotty Youngs, the Charles Woods, the Jackie Matthews, the Daryl Porter, whoever, you know, however many snaps those guys see, how they hold their own against those talented young Maryland receivers and uh, Talia Tukavaloa at quarterback. I think that that's the key to victory. If West Virginia's secondary shows up and looks good with a lot of those new faces, I think they can win this game. So that's the key to victory for me. Uh, Bradley, what about you? Uh, yeah, my key to victory is also going to be on the defensive side. I think our offense is going to be fine. I think we're returning good starters. Jared Diggy's confident. I'm not worried about our wide receivers unless they start dropping balls again. So, uh, yeah, I think the, definitely the key to the winning this game is going to be on the defensive side and trying to stop Talia and his really stout group of wide receiver cores. But I'm going to go with Steven, though. I think that it's the key to the victory is definitely going to be on the defensive line to stop and kind of like slow down that run game, make sure we make Maryland one-dimensional. If you make Maryland one-dimensional – and then you can kind of get pressure on Talia. The dude shown, like you said, he's not afraid to make that big play, but he's not also super safe with the ball. And I think you got guys back there like Alonzo Dye, KJ Martin, and you know some of those guys that have been there for a little while that they're going to make plays on those balls. I don't think that they're going to get uh, beat too bad by these guys if they're given uh, you know a little bit of help from that defensive line. So I think getting pressure up front and really stopping run is going to be our key to victory because I think that's the way you slow down this offense, make them one-dimensional, and then you can just focus on your coverage and that should be an easy, a ball game from there, you know? Right on. I agree. I agree. So I think we're all kind of looking at the West Virginia defense, um, maybe because a lot of the changes there and stuff like that, but all, you know, all of our keys coming, coming that way, I think. So um, that's kind of what, what to watch for there, but let's talk predictions. Then we got our keys. We've talked the matchups. Let's talk score predictions. Um, I'll jump this one off first since I've been letting you guys take the lead so far, but I'm going to take, you know, I wanted to put this game in the thirties, but the more I think about it, the more I think that it might be a game that's played in the twenties. Um, so I'm going to go close one. West Virginia beats Maryland 28 to 24 to start the season. Uh, one and Oh, what do you got Bradley? Um, so if you guys watched our last episode, you know, I'm expecting great things from WVU and I feel no different about this game. I, I think that WVU has been, I've been preaching to these guys all week. I'm telling it to the fans now. I think that this is a perfect matchup for WVU. I think Talia is a super great quarterback. And again, I, I don't want to ever make it seem like I'm shirking on Maryland because that's a, that's a damn good team. And those dudes are very scary. I mean, there's a reason why these two guys on here with me are, you know, sweating a little bit. And that's because it's a damn good team. But I just, I, and it could be, I, I've got my I've got my golden blue glasses on all the year this year until I'm proven wrong, and it could be the very first game of the year, but I don't think it's going to be. I think that I think that Talia is going to throw a pick. I think that Letty Brown's going to have a great day. I think Jared Day is going to take care of the ball. I think the turnover is going to be small. And I think that we come out this game, I'm saying like 38-21 is going to be my guess. I think Maryland's going to score. I don't think you can stop it completely, but I, I think that we're going to have a pretty comfortable time. It might be a little scary in the first half, but I think come second half, I think you'll see WVU pull cool away, and I think we're definitely winning by two touchdowns or more. Wow. See, I'm more I'm more along the lines of what Cruz says. My my uh, score, my I final score right. prediction is is um twenty seven to twenty four. And I think that it's probably going to be a close game all the way up until the end. Um in my mind I think that West Virginia probably wins on either a last second field goal or or a last second, you know, missed opportunity by Maryland because of the defense holds. Um, I think either one of those scenarios I can see playing out in this game. And the only reason I say that is because of how hot Maryland has started out in the last few seasons and we're playing on the road up there and, and what may be a tough environment. You never know, but it might be a tough environment for, for, for Maryland uh, with as well. The WVU says they're, they're going to travel up there, but we shall see. I mean, two thirds of this show will be there, so that's that just goes to show you right there. I've got a wedding this weekend. I can't go. 
or next week. Yeah, upcoming Saturday. Brad, stop attending <laughs> funerals, man. We, we, we got to get football season on the. No, this this one's a wedding. It's not a funeral. No, it's same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I hope our girlfriends. I hope our girlfriends aren't watching. <laughs> Mine usually watches, but that's it's okay. <laughs> Love but you, no, baby. I, I was gonna say, it's, she, she knows. She knows. We kid. We kid. But no, <laughs> I agree with you, Stephen, because that's why I, you had twenty seven, twenty four. I had twenty eight, twenty four. And to me, I think like. Maybe it's 24-21 Maryland. West Virginia scores late, then gets the stop to seal the win. So I'm right there on the same page with you. But uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be a good game. I hope Bradley's uh, right than us because I don't want to have to be sweating it out. But uh, we'll see how it plays out. But either way, all three predicting a win, so that's big. And hopefully the Mountaineers come through with that. Uh, before we close this out, I figured we could end this off with a couple fun topics. Uh, the first of which I wanted to ask you guys, just kind of just for the fun of it. What will be the first offensive play for West Virginia in this game to start this season? Uh, what are you thinking, Stephen? Uh, for me, I think it's going to be the outside zone run. I think West Virginia is going to go pretty simple to for the first play of the game anyway. I think they're going to try to solidify the run game. That way they can do, uh, like Bradley mentioned earlier, and try to open it up and open it up and go over top and, uh, and try to get a big play going because I think that's going to be a lot of West Virginia's um, – success failure ratio this year is how well they can complete convert uh execute big plays and throughout the season i think uh game one is going to be a wonderful opportunity to see how that works but for the first game or for the first play i think we're going to go outside the zone with letty i like it that's uh you know that's a safe pick for sure uh bradley what do you got first play of the season for the mountaineers yeah, I, I'll say I agree with Stephen. I think it's going to be the outside zone. I think Neil Brown's going to play it safe and just do that run up the middle. But just for, you know, different sake, I say it's a play action pass, deep ball to uh, Winston Wright. Hey, I do have – I do have – I like it. I like it. I'll, I'll I think they fake it to Letty Brown on the right. I think they fake it to Letty Brown on the right, and then he turns around and chucks it deep to Winston right on the left, or whoever whoever may be on there over there. I think but they I think run a flea game. flicker with James Gamitter, and then <laughs> Doug Nestor catches a pass in the end zone in the corner like David Seals used to do. That's what I think is going to happen. <laughs> the 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 annexation <laughs> of Puerto Rico. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I'm I'm going. You know, I think I think the safe pick is the handoff to Letty. Uh, like you guys said, that's probably like one of the highest chances. But I'm going to say that we throw a screen, quick screen pass out to Sam James, uh, and he picks up 13 yards, and we start the game off with the first down to my boy. All right, so uh, those are our picks for the uh, first play. What do you guys have as far as who scores the first touchdown uh, for the Mountaineers in 2021? What do you got, Bradley? So after this play action pass, deep ball to Winston Wright that gets us down inside the five, it's going to be Letty Brown. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, but I'll give it to Letty, Letty Brown. Brown punches that's it in cr- from that's short wild. yardage. I have the exact opposite. So I said we start out with an outside zone run to Letty. I think in turn, they open the passing game up, and then they go over the top to who? Your boy Winston Wright. So I think Winston Wright scores the first touchdown of the uh, of the college football season for WB. Uh, he wears number one for a reason. Number one for the first one. That's right. That's right, buddy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really blow some minds here because um, I think that the first touchdown – of the season. Um, I don't know why I'm picking this just to be different and crazy. Cause I am crazy, but, um, Alonzo, Adai, pick six first touchdown. Oh, of the season. I like it. I like it. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say Jared Dagey. Cause I was thinking, you know, close like a couple inches. Yeah, Jared Dagey, quarterback. That was my original pick. Not a million years. Like, I think you were going to say crazy. a pick six. <laughs> I was like, not, not a million years. I think you're going to say pick six. <laughs> And hey, I mean, we were too, a so that's like a deep team last season, six. So, that's uh, not even it's a... possible. Yeah, so you think that they're going to get the ball first? Well, yeah, exactly. Maryland's going to come out slinging it. Yeah, Maryland's going to come out slinging it. We're going to be ready. Alonzo's going to jump in front and take it to the house. 
I'd love to see it. I'm hoping so, buddy. I see. I can see a pick six, but not necessarily oh, from you know, crazy. Alonzo Dye right in the back of that defensive backfield. Whew. I'm hoping if that man, happens. I'm, I'm hoping a lottery has a dog season. Yeah, I think Alonzo is going to be really good this year. I do too. Well, I'm, I'm not really worried about our safeties. I'm more. I'm not, I'm not really worried about any any I think he's got particular a lot of area on defense. But I, I'm concerned a little bit. About the about the quarterback. It's the most untested position on our team, so I think that that's yeah, definitely where we all have question marks at. But I think that's yeah. also where we're going to get a lot of answers at this first game. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Like I said, really good. Right, really well, you good have a lot first of returning week starters matchup. and players, but the the spot where you lost a lot, it was on that defense. And it was also the quality of what we lost too. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it I wasn't agree. like great, we just lost matchup. people due to transfer. I mean, we lost two elite defensive backs to really good, damn good programs. But not once this offseason have I seen Neil Brown sweat it, which makes me feel well, because, a lot more comfortable. Because all of the people that we have, not all of the people, but a great amount of people that we had coming back on defense, whether they started or not, they were they were tested. You know, We had people that, mm-hmm. that had experience last year, which is crazy yeah, because we didn't have a lot of depth last year. Yeah, and I really don't think that I can undersell uh, or over – I don't think I can oversell how important it is to me looking at this game, the difference between those five games and ten games. I mean, you basically played an extra season on them. And so, like, that's that's a lot of experience. And yeah, they had time to practice and think about stuff like that, but it's just not the same as in-game experience. Yeah. Yeah, that is going to play a large factor, I do believe. But I don't believe that it's going to be, you know, as detrimental for, for Maryland as, as a lot of people believe it's going to be, though. Because in turn, if you think about it on the flip side, yeah, they didn't play as many games last year, but that could mean that they're, you know, they're a fresher ball club. They don't have as many injuries, you know, major injuries, any way that could linger and have an effect. There's pros and cons, I guess you could think about on any of it. True. Yeah, you can look at it either way. Yeah. It, could, it could be a plus, could be a minus, yeah. Well, um, so I guess that, a, I guess that's uh, that's pretty much it for the uh, Maryland preview. Unless you guys have anything you want to throw in there at the end here, uh, any final thoughts, whether it be about this Maryland game, about this upcoming season, uh, anything you guys want to throw in here? Uh, you have the floor soapbox moment, if you will. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. No, oh, I was just, I'm excited, man. I'm so excited to get back to football. Uh, you know, we had football last year, but it, it just didn't feel like it was. It was the same. I, you you guys know what I mean. Like, the whole thing last year was just really weird. We didn't play Oklahoma. Yeah, we didn't play Oklahoma. We didn't play as many games as we usually do. I mean, not, you know, being a season ticket holder for the last 13 years, didn't go to a single football game, and that was really heartbreaking. So, I am I am ecstatic about this football season and, and that we've made it to this point. I just hope that we can, you know, we can get through the football season in a smooth ride and, and you know, these numbers and everything with COVID do not continue to grow. Um, that's, that's the only thing that worries me right now, but in the short term, I'm really excited to get up there to college park and watch this football game. They say that the students and, the, and other fans crawl up the back of the stadium to get to the stand. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of eager to see how that works. <laughs> yeah. That'll be a sight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just excited for, like you said, said it's football season. I've been looking forward to this. Bradley, any final thoughts? I think it's like, yeah, it's like every day I've looked at my girlfriend and been like, hey, next Saturday, football, that's coming. And so, yeah, I'm just, hell, I don't care if, I, I wouldn't care if we lost. But I, at this point, I just, I just want to see us play. What's really going to be fun is next week against Long yeah, exactly. Island. Exactly. I'm just ready that it's, it's finally here. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's going to be – I mean, it's going to be fun to watch because you're going to get to see some backups and stuff. You're going to get to see some guys play that you may not get to see. You get to uh, get a look at Garrett Green. That'll be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. I mean, knock on wood, but <laughs> – all right, so uh, I guess that will do it for the uh, first game preview of the 2021 uh, WVU football season. 
Um, as always, I'm your host, Jordan Cruz. Be sure and give us a follow on Twitter at WVU Country Roads. Like us on Facebook, Country Roads Webcast. And of course, now please subscribe to us on YouTube as we're trying uh, to grow that thing up there. Um, that'll, that always helps. And then, of course, you can find us on any podcast platform you prefer. If you prefer the audio only, just search Country Roads Webcast. Subscribe to us. Leave us a rating if you'd like. That's always, always appreciated. But for Stephen and Bradley, until next time. Let's go, Mountaineers. If you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those...